We have, speaking of privilege, we have the privilege of going to the Lord's table uh, this morning. And before we go to the Lord's table, we're briefly going to wrap up our series on 1 John. We've been in 1 John for the last six weeks, and we come to the last chapter in a series entitled The Reality of God. John wants to make it clear before he dies, if all of this is true, if all of this is real, how does it manifest itself in your life and in my life? And so looking at 1 John chapter 5, we're just going to read the first five verses. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. What is the biggest transition in a person's life? What's been the biggest transition in your life? Some in the room might say the biggest transition in a human being's life is when they learn to walk for the first time. They go from crawling to walking is a big transition. Some might say that a big transition is talking, learning how to speak and talk for the first time. For some, it might be going to school when you're a little kid. And that might be the biggest transition of your life. For some, it might be going off to college, moving out of the house, getting your first job, getting married. All might be, for some, the biggest transition that you've ever experienced. But in my opinion, I think it's indisputable that the biggest transition in a person's life is when they're born. When you go from your mother's womb and you are exposed to the real world, could there be anything more dramatic and more significant than the day you were born and came into this world? The most significant event in a person's life is the one thing you absolutely can't remember. And if anybody does remember, we'll have counselors in the back to talk to you after the service. But the most significant event in a person's life is the day you were born. Except for one, there is one event that is more significant than the day you were born. It's the day you were reborn. And that's what John deals with here in 1 John chapter 5. He deals with the greatest transition a person will ever enter into. He deals with the greatest, most significant event that could come into a person's life. And it is the day, as John says, that you are born of God, that you are born a second time, that you are born again. See, the term born again is not a very popular term in our culture. You'll often hear people say, "Um, I'm a Christian, but not one of those born again Christians. You'll often hear people say, I'm a Christian, but not one of those born againers. But what I want us to look at briefly this morning before we go to the Lord's table is that there is no such thing as a Christian and a born-again Christian. You see, if you belong to the family of God, if you are a child of God, it is only because you have been born again. The only reason you're a child of God is because you have been, as John says, born of God. And so briefly this morning, as we wrap up this series I want us to look at the necessity of the new birth, the necessity of being born again, and secondly, the fruit of the new birth. What happens when a person is born again? The necessity of the new birth. John says in verse one, whoever believes in Jesus Christ has been born again. What John is trying to say in verse one is that the only reason you believe, and I'll say it again at the end of this chapter, the only reason you understand is because you've been born of God. You've become a child of God. Theologians call this term regeneration. It's this idea that you could be 
born anew, born a second time. What theologians also say in light of the scriptures is that regeneration precedes faith. That we all of a sudden don't wake up one day going, I think I'll believe. We don't wake up one day and go, yeah, believing in God seems like the right thing to do. The Bible says, and John confirms it here, that the only reason you believe, the only reason you have faith, the only reason you understand is because you have been born of God. You see, the Bible tells us that we all have this fundamental problem. It says, get ready for this, it says we're dead. Yes, you can actually be physically alive but be spiritually dead. All throughout the Bible, it tells us of this dilemma that we all have. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. And all throughout the Bible, it tells us of our need for something inside of us. In fact, the most important thing inside of us, our spirit needs to be made anew. It needs to be born again. There actually needs to be a resurrection that happens inside of you. And all throughout the Bible, it tells us of this dilemma. You see, a dead person isn't much use. A dead person can't really do much. And that's what the Bible says we are. And so when John says the only reason we believe, the only reason we have faith, the only reason we understand is because we've been born of God. We understand that it's God who makes us alive. You might sit here this morning and say, but isn't there something called free will? I mean, don't we have the choice to believe in God or reject God? Well, let's, let's look at one of the most famous conversion stories in the Bible. Let's look at the story of Paul. Paul, before he's a Christian, his name is Saul, and Saul is on the road to Damascus. And what happens on the road to Damascus, God comes down and says this, Hey, Saul, can I get your consent to intervene in your life? Hey, Saul, can I get your permission to become your God and begin a relationship with you? Is that how the story goes? No. Saul is on the road to Damascus, and God comes in like a freight train and knocks him down on his face and says, I will be your God, and you will be my servant. You see, the way God works is that by his sovereign grace, his sovereign pursuing grace and love and mercy comes and pursues us. We just read it last week. While we were yet saints, while we were yet pursuing God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Last week, we love only because who first loved us? Because God first loved us. You see the necessity of the new birth. And John, as he wraps up this letter, this letter of 1 John, he wants us to understand this morning that if you want to believe, if you want to understand, if you want to understand all of these glorious things that we've talked about for the last six weeks, God must come into your life and he must make you come alive. Chuck Colson, Chuck Colson 40 years ago wrote a book called Born Again. Chuck Colson was a Marine officer, Harvard Law graduate, climbed the legal profession so quickly that in his early 30s was appointed special counsel to President Nixon. He was a ruthless political operative nicknamed the hatchet man of the White House. Well, one day, Chuck Colson ran into a gentleman by the name of Tom Phillips and Tom Phillips had just recently become a Christian and everybody warned Chuck, hey, be careful of Tom Phillips. He had a religious experience and he's, he's one of those born again Christians. Hey, be careful of Tom Phillips. I don't know what happened. He's living differently now, but just be careful. He's one of those born againers. But Chuck Colson was curious. He wouldn't know what happened, what happened in Tom Phillips' life. And so Chuck Colson said, hey, can, can, can we meet tonight? I'll come to your house. I want to know more about this experience that you had. And this is what Chuck Colson writes. He says, Tom that night told me about encountering Christ in his own life. What Tom didn't realize is that I was in the depths of deep despair over Watergate. I was watching the president I helped for four years flounder in the office. I also heard that I might become the target of the investigation. In short, my world was collapsing. That night, as Tom was telling me about Jesus, I listened attentively. 
but I didn't let on to my own need. When he offered to pray, I thanked him, but I said no. But when I got in the car that night, I could not drive out of the driveway. This ex-Marine White House tough guy was crying too hard to drive. I was calling out to a God that I had once said didn't exist. I didn't know what to say. I just knew I needed Jesus. And that night in Tom Phillips driveway, I committed my life to Jesus. What happened to Chuck Colson? He became born again. You see, news flash this morning. The death rate, it's hovering around 100%. All of the hospitals and all of the medical advancements and all the yoga and all the kale, all the kale that we eat, guess what? Death is still the leading health concern of our day and there's nothing you can do about it except for one thing. You can become born again. There are many people I know, even in a crowd this size, 20s and 30s that go, I'll deal with that later. But I can also tell you that there are people in their 60s and 70s in this church because I have talked to them that said, I wish I would have made that decision earlier in my life. Do not delay. Do not wait. There are people that are being flung into eternity as we speak that don't know Jesus and don't want to know what it means to be born again. If it is the most significant thing that could ever happen in your life, why would you wait another day? You must be born again. So John not only talks about the necessity of the new birth, but he also talks about what happens. There is something incredible that happens when a person is born of God. There's actually fruit. The apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And in verses two, three, and four, John talks about what is the fruit of the new birth. When somebody is born of God, something actually happens. The first thing that we see here is we get a new heart. The, the Ezekiel tells us that when God enters in, God does something miraculous. He takes the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. And how do we see that in verses two and three? John says, by this we know we love the children of God when we love and obey the commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments, get this, are not burdensome. You see, to the human heart, there was a time where the law of God and his commandments were burdensome. The laws of God were burdensome and condemning. Why? Because only one could perfectly fulfill them. So when we saw the law and we saw the commandments of God, it crushed us and it's designed to do that. So it would point us to the one who perfectly fulfills the law on our behalf. But God says, John says something happens though for the person that is born of God. No longer are they burdensome, but because we have a new heart, now the law, because we know it's been perfectly fulfilled by Jesus, no longer condemns, but it points us to what a life should look like. David in Psalm 1 says the law has now become a delight, which was once a burden. The laws of God, the commandments of God are no longer burdensome. They are no longer weighing on us, but we begin to grow in affection to the law and the commandments of God. Why? Because our new heart is changed and a heart that was one at animosity with God, at enmity with God, now grows in love and affection with God. And when my heart grows in affection with God and towards God, I now my heart begins to love the things of God, the commandments of God the laws of God. St. Thomas Aquinas said, the greatest miracle was not creation. The greatest miracle was the rebirth of the human heart. A heart that was one time at animosity with God now loves and grows in affection with God daily. The greatest miracle, the rebirth of the human heart. It's no longer burdensome because now we have the power now we have the power that comes from the Holy Spirit of reigning sin that what we sing, what do we sing? It sets the prisoner 
free, the power of God working in us, no longer burdensome. But not only does John say the person that is born of God have a new heart that grows in its affection of God and the things of God, but John says we also have a new mission. Verse four, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. In fact, he says it's victory. We have victory over overcoming the world. What is John trying to say here? Well, all throughout John, John is chiefly concerned with what? That his people are being tempted away, pulled away and being tempted by the things of this world. What John is chiefly concerned about is that his people would look at what the world offers versus what God offers and they would pick the world. That the world would be more attractive, that the world would be more beautiful, that the world would tempt them. And what John says, no, no. Our mission and our purpose changes. Our outlook changes. You see, when the person's heart has been born again, when a person is born of God, they have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to buy the lie that what the world offers is greater than what God offers. In fact, quite the opposite. We then begin to clearly see, and we then can sing that when I turn my eyes upon Jesus, the things of this world will grow what? strangely dim. You see, what John is trying to say is that those that have been born of God have the power, have the ability by faith alone to say, no, this world does not deliver on its promises, but God does. And what the Christian is able to say that has been born of God is to be able to look at the world and say, stop, Stop with your offers. Stop with your temptations. Stop with trying to lure me away because they see in Jesus that which is most beautiful. And when the person of faith sees Jesus for who he truly is and what he's done in their behalf, he slowly becomes more beautiful and more glorious than anything this world has to offer. Why? Because he offers the thing that you crave the most. You long for forgiveness The world can't offer that perfectly, but Jesus does. You long for love. The world can't offer that, but Jesus does unconditionally. You long for acceptance and approval. The world can't offer that perfectly, but Jesus does. You long for a clean slate and to start over again. The world can't offer that, but Jesus does. And when we see Jesus for who he truly is, he becomes more beautiful and more glorious than anything this world has to offer. I call it, we begin to live with a full heart. You see, everything we do is typically done because our hearts are empty and we want it to be filled up again. Even things we do for God sometimes are done because our heart, we think, is empty. But when we see Jesus for who he truly is and our hearts are full, we can begin to love God and love others and give and not get because our heart is overflowing with joy and peace and everything we ultimately long for. You become a new creation. You begin to operate in your mission and purpose in life with the same love that captured you. And it changes everything. It changes you, it changes your neighbor, it changes your city and your community, and it ultimately changes the world. The same love that captured you is the same love that you now demonstrate. You know what happened to Chuck Colson? He was arrested. Chuck Colson was eventually arrested and sent to federal prison. Here is this brand new Christian that is sent away to prison to serve time. Well, on the day he was released from prison, he walks out of prison near the pan, in the panhandle of Florida and he gets on a plane and he goes home to his wife in Virginia. And as he's lying in bed that night, he says to his wife, I will never step foot in a prison again. It's a living hell. Well, Chuck Colson didn't sleep one hour that night. He tossed in his, and he turned because all that Chuck Colson could think about was the men that he had done Bible study with. All he could think about was the men that he prayed with. And most importantly, all he could think about were the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men that were not yet born again and had failed to commit their life to Jesus Christ. So what did Chuck Colson do? The next morning, his first day of freedom He gets on a plane and he goes back to the prison in the panhandle of Florida and he launches a ministry known as Prison Fellowship that has seen thousands and thousands upon thousands of people all around the world enter a relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? 
because the hatchet man of the White House had a new heart. The hatchet man of the White House had a new identity. The hatchet man of the White House was born of God. Every week I stand up here. If you've never actually filled out one of these cards, here they are. The Connect card. And every week I stand up here and I tell you, can you fill this out if you're visiting? We'll get your name and your email and your phone number. You can sign up for mobile text alerts. You can update your contact information. You could say whether you're a first-time guest, a regular attendee, a seasonal uh, member, or a full-time member. You could check off the list about joining a Bible study, finding out about a new ministry, or even volunteering. All that stuff is useful. But you know what the most important thing on this card says? Contact me about having a relationship with Jesus. We can get your address and your email and your phone number some other time. But if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, if you're here this morning and you had no idea that to get all of the stuff we've talked about for the last six weeks in 1 John, that all you had to do was be born again. I would encourage you as soon as the service is over that you would go out into that fellowship hall lobby. You'd fill out this card and see what happens when you embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and see your life turned over to God and transformed forever. If you decide to follow Jesus today and enter into a relationship with him, we have a little book for you uh, in the Fellowship Hall lobby. If you bring that card, we'll give you a little book that just tells you, answers some basic questions. What does all this mean? I have a relationship with Jesus. What does it mean to be born of God and maybe help you on your journey in this new relationship with Jesus Christ. How? How is it that simple? John says, all you have to have is faith. And the same John that wrote 1 John, the same John that writes in 1 John, uh, in 1 John 1, whoever believes in him has the right to become a child of God. And the same John will write two chapters later in John chapter three, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never die but have everlasting life. At the very end of 1 John chapter five, John says, the reason I wrote all of these things is so that you might know that you have eternal life. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life? Do you know that you know that you know that you've been born of God? You can become born of God today. Become his child simply by believing in Jesus' work on your behalf.